morning. And um, let me go ahead and open us up in prayer. And I'm sure a few more will be coming shortly. So dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you would be working in the lives of each of the students in this course, Lord. A number of students have been getting sick. And so I pray that you would um, restore their health. Pray that you would help each of the students to see the value of the material that they're covering. It can be difficult being in school and just having so much that you're taking in. And I pray that you would help them to manage that and just continue to cherish these times. And hopefully in the midst of this, um, have fun and see how this is enabling them to have a bright future. I also pray that you would help them with their spiritual formation, Lord, that you would have them um, really learn a lot from their getting exposed to scripture from folks that have studied it for a long time, the theological concepts in which we want to be guiding our lives by and give them interesting and creative ways for, for faith integration. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Amen. So what I was planning to, to talk about today was um, we are continuing now in our um, the, the central processing unit, and I'm going to be continuing to be talking about um, the instruction sets and actually doing um, processing will bringing will be bringing in the idea of um, a pipeline and how to um, you can be thinking of like an assembly line. Maybe you've seen pictures of that. You can think like a um, automobile assembly line, and so everybody has their station, and so one person puts on the doors, one person puts in the engine, and so what happens if um, one of those stations breaks down? It causes um, a, a backup, and so. What are some of the potential ways of how you could be minimizing that? The thing with programming language is it's not just an assembly line that you just add a door, add an engine. It's like you have a, a branch, okay. Now it's like, okay, is this a uh, convertible or is this a um, four wheel drive? And so you have all of these things that you have to be managing in terms of that assembly line, if you try and keep thinking about it from, from that analogy point of view. So um, I'll talk about that. And also I'll spend a few minutes talking about our Arduino projects and more focus that on, on Thursday. I think we've got um, just about everybody that I know except one that still, we're still trying to troubleshoot that. And so we're, we're trying to, to do that real time. And so um, hopefully we can get through to figure out what's going on on that front. So Ryan, I'll, I'll look forward to hopefully what we've got going now is, is helping you figure out that, that problem and uh, if there's a, a driver. And I'll, I'll just mention it briefly now, but we're seeing a whole range of processing environments. And so you can think of the, the lowest level that you have exposure to is this Arduino. It literally doesn't have an operating system. So imagine you can think like um, the imitation game. I, I spoke to you about that, Alan Turing. When they were doing computing, it's not like they were running with Windows OS or, or Mac OS. It was just basically they were real close to, the, you could say like doing assembly language. And so we have an Arduino. I've mentioned the Raspberry Pi. You've seen me do a little bit of that. And then we can go from that to like, say, a cell phone, a tablet, a desktop, and then a, um, a server type of environment where you can have things that are way um, over on that end. So that just kind of gives you the spectrum that we're getting exposed to. Um, so last Tuesday, we started to talk about um, the, the second chapter we, we, we talked about the process structure and function. And then the, the next thing that we started to get into was to be thinking about, well, what are the distinctives between a, um, a reduced instruction set computer? And um, so this is where we started to be thinking a little bit about um, things on, on that front. So, um, I'm going to just pick up a, a few things from, from that chapter and we'll then just start to introduce things from, from that and the, um, the, the chapter following. And so basically we're 
there are some summary tables here that, that show you um, some specific characteristics between three different types of processes that they're calling them. The complex instruction set, the CISC, and so the Intel-based um, computers, but other things that are fall into that range. The reduced instruction set, um, like the ARM, and there's also some other type of processors like the Spark um, um, and, and, and some others. And so Spark is an example of a processor that was um, picked up by Sun Microsystems, and I'll focus a little bit on that. But there's another thing that we haven't really talked about, and we'll be focusing it more um, in the next couple of lectures, is what can be talk, talk, called a, a superscalar. Do you remember how we talked about in, um, say, in memory, having caching? Um, it actually makes improved performance. It may not be obvious to, to think what why that would be the case. And you have L1, L2, and L3 cache. Well, this is where we start to get into these things of how do we optimize a pipeline when we have to be thinking about, we don't know for sure what's going to come next. And so there's, there's it's like prediction, um, it's different, but just to give you an idea, Windows has something called prefetch. And so basically it knows that you use um, Windows products a lot. So um, Microsoft Word or PowerPoint or something like that. So it's actually, when you boot up your computer, it's going to prefetch those things into a, an area where it's gonna be able to um, do that, pull those things up a lot faster. So that's that's some of the things that are going on with a, a super scalar processor and what they're they're trying to introduce. Um, so that was a little bit of a context to to be thinking about. And so I'm just going to um, kind of just go forward a, a little bit here on and just mention a few things. Okay, um, so maybe you've heard of the concept of a circular buffer. This is something I talk about in um, CS260. And so um, say if you have like a queue or a stack, it has some, some analogies that you can be thinking of. But so if you're constantly taking things from the front of the line and um, and you're adding things to the back of the line. And so if you're managing to, to keep things at a steady state, then you can see that that line's going to be about the same size. That means the, the, the amount of things that you're taking out of the front of the line is equal to those that are at the end of the line. And so by having a buffer that's a circular buffer, it actually has um, better utility in its overall utilization. And so it would almost seem like, I'll just, just do this in a simple way, just all these things that are gray, that you can see that those are things that are part of what's in the, the waiting in the line. And so as you take things out of it, this is gonna come out. And so it's gonna seem like it's gonna start rotating, but it just gives you better utilization of those resources that are, are available in that, that buffer, that register, or, or what have you. And so this is a technique that, that starts to come up in um, how we deal with a, a central processing unit and dealing with um, um, pipelining. So the circular um, organization is shown here, which depicts a circular buffer of six windows. The buffer is filled to a depth of, of four, um, a called B, B called C, C called D with procedures D active. And so we're just, we can have like a, a set of um, uh, elements that are made available in that buffer that we can allocate. And so there's different, this is more complicated than one little bit of information, but we can be um, aggregating that into related chunks. And so we can have that um, in a sense of what we would be doing for 
a circular buffer. Um, so, um, chances are that maybe you don't really know if you have a, a complex instruction set computer or a reduced instruction set computer, but in this course, now you're getting some exposure to those things in ways that you haven't thought about. And so the, the strategy for a reduced instruction set computer was that if you just keep things simple, the same length, um, we've, we saw that in our Mars emulator that everything was um, 32 bits in length, that um, hopefully that means that for a lot of operations, besides say like scientific computations, that you would get things working out quite well. So with complex, there is a trend to move in the direction of rich instruction sets, which includes a large and more complex number of instructions. So it, it's um, the principle is a desire to simplify compilers. And so this is exactly what you need. And with a reduced instruction set computer, you may have to do um, three or four instructions to do something equivalently. So this is um, what they were trying to do at the assembly level to try and help that out. Um, so there are two advantages to smaller programs. The program takes up less memory and it should improve performance. So that's kind of the, the general um, rationale for that, but what actually happened when we think about it. So let's take a RISC um, processor and compare it with other sys type of um, um, examples and how much um, shorter are those things. And so we see like maybe some examples of 0 0.8, 0 0.9. Here's an example, it's actually a little bit longer. And so it's not always the case that you're gonna end up having um, improved performance. And so that's one of the things that is, is out there that um, has comes up. Um, so for a reduced instruction set architecture, it tries to have one machine instruction per machine cycle, trying to be very efficient. Um, it has the register to register operations, um, simple addressing modes and simple instruction formats. So you can think of a real basic architecture Maybe there's not going to be much difference between a CISC and a RISC, but now we're trying to get into a little bit more detail and highlight some of those things that might be uh, some second um, layer type of um, things that, that would be in there. So that's just um, a, a, another little thing that I, I wanted to be pointing out. Um, let me just... Um, Go out of full screen mode for a second. I want to check where I'm at. Yeah, so I'm going to sort of be jumping around a, a little bit here. So let me go back to um, chapter 16. Um, we we introduced this this idea of um, pipelining in in this chapter. So let me make sure that I'm sharing it. it seems like every time I go out of full screen mode, it it quits the the sharing on um, Zoom. So we we started to um, think about the how things flow in the the execution in a CPU that there's various steps and um, we there's uh, basic things that a, a CPU does 
Um, So I, I showed you another different type of emulator other than the Mars that it, it you can actually see things in um, going through the execution process. And so um, we saw that, well, this would be like a perfect world um, pipeline that you actually are keeping it full all the time. And so this that might actually be possible if you don't have any branches or or or, or other things that are going to cause some issues. And so we, we talked about this last Tuesday, and here we, we showed an example. It illustrates the effect of a conditional branch using the, the same program that we have um, here that we listed on this slide. And it assumes that um, instruction three is a conditional branch to instructional 15. Until the instruction is ex executed, there is no way of knowing which instruction will come next. The pipeline in this example simply loads the, the next instruction in sequence, that is instruction four, and proceeds. So in figure 1610 on the previous slide, the branch is not taken and we get the, the full performance benefit of the, the enhancement. In figure 611, the branch is taken. So, so we'll say that again, in the previous figure, it's not taken and so we're able to have this nice clean uh, ex example of execution, but in here we see that it does. And so this is something that's going to cause problems. So, um, so until the instruction is executed, there's no way of knowing which instruction will come next. The pipeline in this example simply loads the next instruction in sequence and proceeds in figure 10. 610, um, 1610, the branch is not taken and we, we get the full performance benefit. 1611, the branch is taken. This is not determined until the end of time unit seven. At this point, the pipeline must be cleared of the instructions that are not used. During this time, unit eight, instruction 15 enters a pipeline. No instructions complete during units nine through 12 um, and this is the performance penalty incurred. So I'm just trying to give you, um, it would be better if I had a, um, a, um, a movie that was showing you, but we're, we're seeing the impact of what happens when you have a, 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 a branch or something like that. It's, it's going to be messing things up. So, um, here we have an alternative um, depict, um, depiction of that for what we were showing in, in 1610 and 1611. It shows the progression of the time horizontally across the, the figure with each row showing the progress of an individual instruction. So figure 1613, what we have here, shows the same sequence of events with the time progressing vertically down the, the figure in each row showing the, the state of the pipeline at a given point in time. So when we have things all across the board, it means that the pipeline is full. That's what you want. Anything short of that, so initially you have to fill up the pipeline. So this gives you, um, we have at least maybe a third or um, not quite a half the time we have the pipeline full. When we do a branch, there's only two um, times when we have that the, the pipeline is completely occupied. And so we would like to see if there's a way of improving that, that type of performance. And so um, there's been different studies that have been trying to, to figure out how to speed things up, sort of in the same strategy, the same type of ideology of thinking about caches on, and buffers and stuff like that. So um, the, the textbook talks about three different types of hazards. Um, so there's a resource contention, there can be data contention, or there can be control con contention. And they, they talk about all three of those. And when you have that kind of contention, you end up with a pipeline bubble. And those are the types of things that you want to be trying to, to minimize as, as much as possible. So um, there's a, a handful of charts and things that are in the textbook that take each one of these at a time. First of all, thinking about resource contention, 
data contention and control contention and what would be the, the impact of those um, when you have that. So you're gonna maybe have situations where you're gonna have an idle cycle that you, you can't fill. And so you just have to do something like a no op to um, write out that bubble. And so you're just gonna have to not quite have things as efficient as you would like. So there's resource contention, there's write, um, there's data contention. So um, you have to wait for a read to complete. Um, uh, you have to wait for a write to complete before you can do a read. And so memory is the slowest element that you have to be dealing with. Um, maybe you want to do a write after a read, so you have to wait for the read to, um, to, to complete, or you want to write, and then you find out that, no, I need to put something else in that data module. And so these are the kind of things that, um, in a pipeline sense, that this could be, be a problem that you're going to bump into. And so then you have uh, control hazards, say like um, you, you're doing some for to, for, form of branching. And um, so that is another area that could really affect what your pipeline performance is doing. So what are the different possible ways that you can be dealing with branches? You can have multiple streams. So you have multiple pipelines or sub pipelines for, for part of it. Um, I mentioned this term, prefetch. You can have a prefetch um, tar um, branch target. Maybe if you have two possibilities, you have two streams that you dedicate. One, say you, you branch and one that you don't. You can have that loop buffer. And I showed you that, um, that circular buffer example. Um, and then you try to, to figure out, well, based on what is, has been done, say in the last 10 instructions or the last day, something you have come up with predictions and you say, what is the most likely case that you would, would do? And another strategy is a delayed branch. So, uh, you know, it's like you start to break it up into um, threads uh, and so into packets, if some of you may have a little bit of experience with communication theory. So these are some strategies that are out there that can help to try and improve the, the pipeline performance. So multiple streams, uh, a simple pipeline um, suffers a penalty for a branch instruction because it, it must choose one of two instructions to fetch and next and may make the wrong choice. So a uh, brute force approach is to replicate the initial portions of the pipeline and allow the pipeline to fetch both instructions, making use of two streams. So that would be possible. This is gonna take more resources. Um, and so um, maybe that's a good choice, maybe not. And one of the things that Stallings does is he also gives you, there's been a lot of research and ongoing research that helps us to, to help us decide if those are good decisions or not. You could do a pre-fetch um, of a branch target when a, a conditional branch is recognized that the target of the branch is pre-fetched in addition to the instruction following the branch. So you, you, you fetch a bunch of stuff and you're trying to hedge your bets a little bit here. And so thus we get the, the term of a, a, a prefetch. You can have a loop buffer. And so a small, very high speed memory maintained by the instruction fetch stage at the, the pipeline and contains the end most recent fetch instructions in sequence. And so um, picture's worth a thousand words. And so here now we're seeing this example, it's like this, um, this cache or um, now we're having a, a buffer. And so we, we load up a bunch of it, different instructions. And so maybe this is a, a smarter strategy that can help us to figure out which way we're, we're going to go and, and try and help out there. So there can be various techniques used to, to predict whether a branch will be taken. And so here we see an example. So you can, the possibilities of the, the, the 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 one that you predict it's it's never taken it's always taken or maybe you could be using the the opcode to help guide you what you're going to do so these are static approaches they do not depend on the execution history or the, the time of the the condi conditional branch instruction and so you have some form of prediction that you 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 use 
Another possibility is you have a, a taken slash not taken switch. So you're, you're going down multiple paths and one of them becomes irrelevant. So you can just stop that. Or you can have a branch history table. So maybe you progress down a, a thread and says, nope, that's not the right one. So you have to back up. So you have to undo those things and go down another branch. So these just give you some of the examples of, of things that can be going um, behind the scenes that you guys are getting exposed to as we're, we're talking about some of these things in more detail in this class. So I won't go through this, um, this branch prediction flowchart, but this is the kind of thing that would need to be um, laid out in terms of a, um, a, a, an algorithm, and then you're implementing this algorithm so you can have a, um, a strategy for how you're going to try and do this. And the goal is to try and improve performance. So um, this is a, a state diagram. Maybe some of you have heard of that. It's trying to say these are all the different states that you could be going in and how you go from one state to another. And so this just gives you a, a representation of what it would be. So it's just kind of like a, a different way of thinking about a, a flow chart, but now we're trying to be focusing on, well, what are the specific states, the, the, the different places that it could be and how you would um, go from one to another. So, um, so when we have this, this fetch execute cycle and the, we we have layers that go more complicated beyond that. Um, we can we can have a, a way to start to be um, trying to improve performance. And so here in this figure, it contrasts a scheme with a predict never taken strategy. With the former strategy, the instruction fetch stage always fetches the next sequence addresses. If a branch is taken, some logic in the processor detects this and instructs that the, the next instruction be fetched from the, the target address. The branch history table is treated as a cache. So there's that word again, a cache. So we have another cache. Each prefetch triggers a, a lookup in the branch history table. If no match is found, the next sequence address is used for the fetch. If a match is found, a prediction is made based on the, the state of the instruction. Either the next sequential address or the branch target address is fed to the, the select logic. So the, the textbook has more details on that, but that's just trying to, to give you an idea. Here's a strategy for how you're trying to improve pipeline performance and yet trying to deal with branches. So here is um, an example for an Intel 8486, um, the, the way that it does its, its pipelining. And so at first it has the fetch. And so we've, the most basic level, we can think of the fetch execute. But now we, we realize that if we're going to be loading things into an ALU, we have to first collect that information. And so we're, say we're dealing with registers and say that registers are pointing to memory. And so that, and then we have to get the contents of that memory, put it into the right binary format and then load it into the registers, the things that are connected directly to that ALU so we can actually do the execute. And so what the Intel architecture for the 486, it does it in two steps. And so there's two decode cycles, there's the execute, and then it writes the results back into to memory. So it's a, another approach to um, something that I mentioned before, with, with these types of details. And so we have the fetch, we have the decode, we have the execute and we have the write. And some of these other things are um, in, hooked into this, this, this decode that is done in a couple of phases, the way that they annotate it for um, an 8486. So that's just an example of what is, is going on here. So, um, this is just gives some, some more details. I'll just skip over this for, for now. So we have a simple pipeline organization. So we have those, those basic five elements. 
we have some, some cash that are helping out here. And so now we have a, a couple of different cash, say for um, different fields. Um, and so this is something that we're showing here. And this is yet a, an even more complicated um, complex organization that further enhances performance. And the, the following are the changes. Um, so we have this level of cash, the I cash and the D cash, and then we have an L2 cash that is there. We have this, um, this buffer here that's included. Um, so we can see that there's there's can be a, a lot of more complexity that we can be adding to our, our CPU architecture to try and help um, improve the, the pipelining. So I'm just trying to give you a little bit of a sense of how that would be. And so here we can see um, how that, that caching scheme could be things that would be loaded into the ALU. Um, okay, those are just a few more details that I didn't cover last Tuesday that I wanted to just spend a little bit more time talking about for, for that chapter. Okay, so what have we spoken about? So we talked about the structure and function. We did that in chapter 16. And then I, I slowly went into this next chapter, thinking about the reduced instruction set. Um, I focused a little bit on a chart that was talking about the CISC versus the RISC characteristics. Um, we have these three different types of characteristics of some processors. You can have the CIS, the RISC, and a superscalar processor. And then the superscalar processor is something that we'll get a chance to be talking about in the, the next chapter. Um, so here we can see that the, um, the x86 falls into this um, CISC type of processor. Um, the Spark is an example of a RISC. This is the one that I mentioned that is done by Sun Microsystems. And then we have some other ones that are, um, they may have some characteristics that are in RISC, but then there's a, a couple other things that try to add some of these um, more sophisticated approaches for pipelining. The PowerPC, for those that have used Macs for a long time, they was a PowerPC is before they had the Intel processor. Now they have their the, the Apple Silicon. The UltraSpark was the next generation beyond just a Spark processor. And um, the, the, the Spark processor, actually they open sourced that, that processor and the work that we're doing in our CubeSat effort is actually has a processor, it's a, called a PIC. And so it's, it's taking up the, that open source architecture and it actually has an implementation that we're using for some of our, our, um, our breadboard testing and development efforts on that. So, and, and there's a couple other processors here that I, I won't go into to detail, but just to highlight a few things. So um, I kind of um, did a, a, a spoiler and jumped a little bit ahead for, for some of these things, but um, people do things in high level language. Um, that's where 90 plus percent of programming is going to be at. And so, well, now we're, we're kind of thinking things down at the CPU level. Well, what is going to impact in the best way the kind of programming that we're going to be doing at high level language, is it going to be using a, um, a CISC based um, instruction set, a, a RISC based instruction set, or maybe having some of these other more elaborate types of things that we can be doing to be helping the, the pipeline performance. Those are the, the things that we get a chance to, to see in chapter 17 as we're starting to, to walk through this. Um,
So let me um, let me just focus on this chart for a minute. So, um, so instruction pipelining is often used to enhance performance. So we can um, consider the the context of a this in the context of a risk architecture. Most instructions are register to register has the, the following two stages. We have the, the fetch execute, that's what we're familiar with. And so this we're gonna be talking about the I would be the instruction fetch, the E would be the execute. Um, so actually do, performs an, an arithmetic logic unit operation with register inputs and outputs. Uh, for load and store operations, these stages are required. The, the instruction fetch, the execute, which calculates the, the memory address, and then the what we use here for D, the um the the memory register to memory or memory to register operations. So what we're trying to, to show here is some four different um, examples. So it depicts the timing of a sequence of instructions using um, no pipelining. So that's what we see here, just a sequential execution. And so we can see five commands here. And if I were to count two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 12 plus type of um, cycles that need to take place to get that all done. Clearly this is a wasteful process. Each even very simple pipelining can substantially improve performance. So figure 17, 6B shows a two-stage pipelining scheme in which the I and E stages of the two different instructions are performed simultaneously. So we can start to be doing th more than one thing at a time. And so we this is something that we, we can be um, doing to, to help out. And so we can see the number of clock, clock cycles, two, four, six, eight, 10 or so. And so we can actually, this is gonna be, this is gonna execute faster. Um, so that would be one advantage that we would see with that. The two stages of the pipeline are an instruction fetch stage and an execute slash memory stage that executes the instruction, including register to memory and memory to register operations. So that's um, another possibility that we have here. Pipelining can be improved further by performing two memory accesses per stage. So um, this yields the sequence shown um, down here, C. Now up to three instructions can be overlapped and this improves it as much as a factor of three. So we saw up here, we couldn't do any, sorry. We couldn't do any overlapping. So we had to do all the things one at once. Here we could be doing some overlap of one. Now we can have overlapping of two and so now we have like um, several different streams that are going on. So it's going to take less time. It's um, and we can have things done in parallel. So that's going to actually be um, an improvement. Um, so that's that's something that we can see that is um, advantageous. And then um, one other case here. Because of the simplicity and regularity of the risk instruction set, the design of the phasing into three or four stages is easily accomplished. So this is a, this just gives you a little indication that a, a risk instruction set can actually do this pipelining, say, a little bit easier than what is done with an Intel-based type of architecture. Figure 17D shows the results with a four-stage pipeline. Up to four instructions at a time can be under can be underway and the maximum potential speed up is a factor of four. So note again, the use of no ops to account for data and branch delays. And so there's a couple of no ops. We have to wait for everything to come out of the other end of, of the cycle. We have a couple of things there. So that's just um, truth in advertising. Um, um, no pipelining to three and four pipelining just to give you a sense of how things can be changed with um, with what we're doing on on that front. So I think those are some of the the 
comments that I wanted to be sharing so far as we're thinking about this material. Um, and I'll, I'm going to, to pick up some of this on Thursday. Um, but let me just comment on a, a few other things that are in this chapter. Um, they talk about a, a couple of different types of processors. Um, some of them that aren't the, the, the central focus of what we're dealing with in this computer with the ARM and the Intel x86 architecture. But um, I, I'm, I'll just spend a little bit of time talking about the, the Spark. And so this was developed by Sun Microsystems. Um, um, so Sun had a, the, the way it looked at the, the, it was always a focus on doing things with the internet. And so your machine was basically a means of connecting to the internet. So very much a, a, um, a distributed type of uh, strategy that they were trying to, to think about. So this was a scalable processor architecture um, developed by Sun Microsystems and Sun licensed the architecture to offer vendors to, to produce Spark compatible machines. And so, like I said, now that they've actually open sourced that, and so um, you could develop your own processor if you wanted to. So you can think of like our Arduino kits. Um, how many people bought an Arduino kit that was made by um, um, Arduino? Probably none of us, although I think they still do make them, but with the, the things that I made available, um, it could be any number of vendors but it still was using that same architecture as, as a basis. And so that's what they, they, they did. It was inspired by the, the Berkeley Risk one machine and its instruction set and register organization is based closely on the Berkeley Risk model. There's the UltraSpark, which was like um, um, a, another example of something that they refined um, after that. I actually, um, it's been a while now, now, but I actually bought a um, Sun workstation that I had at home. I'm a geek. I like to spot anything that has a CPU in it. So um, it just it was kind of fun for a while, but now then Sun Microsystem got bought by Oracle, or I don't know if it was a uh, what they wanted, but anyway, Oracle bought them, and so it kind of changed their whole strategy. And um, I don't. I think they still do make servers. I haven't actually checked the server market percentages. And so Sun had a big um, component there. IBM did well as well. And IBM has sold both their, their PC market as well as their server market, unfortunately. And so there's, there's been a lot of changes that have been going on. The, um, the Solaris operating system has now been largely replaced by, by Linux. And so although you can still get Solaris, and every once in a while I download it and see if I can figure out what's changed, but um, it's not really as maintained as well by Oracle as what Sun was, was doing. But it was actually um, a good um, processor. Uh, just the other trends in the marketplace actually moved it away from the, the sweet spot that they had um, developed. I, I won't go into some of the, the details here, but you can be looking in the textbook or the, the lecture notes to get some more insight on that but it just gives you another example. We can see that there's a, a broad array of different types of architectures that we're getting exposed to in this class. Okay, um, I'm gonna stop um, for, for this. There, there may be a few more topics that I'll refer to on Thursday, but um, let me switch over and I'm going to ask Ryan to see if he's had any more success with your kit. I did, like, I finished downloading that uh, construction and I did see what the problem was. My laptop only has USB 3.0 ports. Yeah. The driver is only compatible with USB 2.0 ports. Okay. So I need to get an inverter. Um, Josiah, you actually had the same board that he has, and I don't know if you have a Mac or a PC. I got a PC. Well, maybe, do you have Windows 11 or Windows 10? 11. Okay, he has Windows 10. I was wondering if you guys could maybe compare notes a little bit to see, did you have to um, install a, a, did you have to? Well, the issue for my notebook with USB is like, um, that's a surprise. So I could use the major, right? 
Yeah, yeah. I selected um the Uno instead for the semester, but I went back to in the IDE like select the board and I selected the one that said data on the level. But it actually came up. So I think we'll kind of try that. I tried Uno in and uh and not doing before, and I checked, and I think it is by the force. Well, I I would yeah, I'm not. Well, we can explore that, but this is what I had showed, um, I believe it was last Thursday. Um, I have a variety of different um, Arduinos. The, and so I had the Arduino Nano, or it's actually by the, this company, and I actually had to download the driver to get it to work on Windows 11. Okay. So, um, and when I was looking up the... Um, at the beginning of the course, when I was trying to help Brian, this was the website that I found, and I think you were trying to download the the information that they had. Yes, that was where I got the information that oh, if it's USB three point oh, then it's just not going to work. So th this is it's the same company that I had for for this, and it, when I downloaded this driver, it it worked. So um, there is a chance that um, maybe this driver might work for you. So um, just for kicks, let's see if I can. I ended it out of the call with some stuff. Okay. I'll put that in the chat as well. So why I wanted to, to just um, spend at least a minute to be talking about this is, um, remember, um, we've talked about the um, von Neumann architecture. So you have the CPU, you have the memory and the input and output. And so we can see with um, the Arduino kit that we're having to, to work with the IO, our computer is reaching out to, to this type of a module and so we have to be um, sending input to it and then receiving information from that. You can have that say with the plotter function or the um, getting the, the text monitor of, of that coming out. And so this does not have an operating system. And so basically what it has, it has a, um, a mechanism, one of the two um, processors that's in, contained in the the, the guts of the system is actually the thing that, that deals with converting that information to the USB format. It, it is plug and play, but it, do, it does have a limited number of things that it's, um, it can plug and play that Windows or, or Mac OS is going to be able to find. And so we're running into a little bit of this with what Ryan has with his board. So I just wanted to maybe give a little bit of context and um, have you um, get, get some perspective from what other students are experiencing, both the, the good and the bad. Okay, um, for Thursday, I'm gonna be showing a different type of um, example. So, um, it, it is one of the, the things that I've shared in Canvas. And so um, if you want to take a look at the one of the, the videos on, on these, I'll um, feel free to, to do that. So just uh, let me give you a reminder where that, that is in Canvas. So under project related videos, So I had an overview on the Arduino. And so this is the one that I was going to do. And it's, this is the, um, it's a, it, it's a, an LED that actually has three colors. And so it actually, this LED, and you should have one of these in your kit um, that either can go, it's an RGB. So it is red, green, and blue. And it, the, if you just play these videos, you'll get a chance to be following along with that. So not quite as much information as I put with a push button, but just trying to give you another example 
that um, we can have a chance to to think about that on Thursday. Okay. Um, any other comments or questions? All right. Well, I think that's a good um, breaking point. So God bless you all. Um, stay healthy. I know some of you have been fighting a cold or or stuff, and we'll see each other on Thursday. And remember, next week is Thanksgiving week, so we won't have classes, but I will be available if anybody does have any questions. Okay. Take care.